Time to see if we can bring this here Tone Master back to life. Had to order a few little bits and bobs. They're all here now, so let's get started. Let me tell you uh, my thought process in troubleshooting this. Before I even tell you that, I'll let you know a couple of important things about the value of this little community that we've built here on this channel. Sometimes the internet can be a really nice place when you have a bunch of people sharing common interests. So for those rare times, yay us. But, um, you know, this was a common complaint. I saw people posting about, hey, it's, you know, the red light blinks for the software update, nothing, no sound, no power, et cetera, et cetera. Various rumors about, yeah, Fender fixed it for free. It was a diode in the power section. I contacted the local Fender repair service. They'd never heard of this. They didn't have any service bulletins on it, whatever. Um, and so while I did find the problem independently, within an hour or two of the first video being up, Howard Rose posted the clue, including the correct diode part number. Then a few hours later, Brad Webb, Brad's Guitar Garage, reached out to me. It was a few hours later because either, you know, he's Australian, different time zones, etc., or he's a lazy bastard, your choice. He reached out to me with the information as well. And I can't prove that I already figured it out on my own, but I, I had. So let me tell you my thought process. While it doesn't apply specifically to the Tone Master, it's just a general troubleshooting thing. Okay. The rumor was diode was burning in the power supply. Well, this is the power supply. This is the actual power supply. This is an ICE module. And it's not uncommon for these things to have problems. Sometimes diodes, very commonly, the problem with the, an ICE power module is a ferrite bead burns and, you know, opens, goes short, and then you just don't have a connection where there's supposed to be a connection. So the first thing I did was I looked around and I found which ICE module this is. And I looked at the price, and I could get another one for about 135 bucks. So 150 bucks was shipping. That was the break glass in case of emergency option. But to see if that was necessary, I disconnected everything, removed the board, examined it closely, top and bottom. Did not see, did not smell anything at all here. So I was kind of unsure whether this would be a problem. It's very difficult without a schematic to know where to take measurements for voltages and these kinds of things, because I, I can, I can sometimes grab a little bit of a, of a thing and say, okay, we've got plus 35, negative 35. That's probably fine, whatever it is. But I don't know where in the rest of the amp to measure because I don't have the schematic and it's basically a little computer. But if your troubleshooting involves the logical flow, you kind of know where to go next. All right. So it's probably not here. Where next? Well, while it could have been over here somewhere in this general area, this is stuff that doesn't get hot. But here, it's a great big heat sink. And if a diode's gonna fail, it's quite often heat related. So I thought, what's under this heat sink? Now I've already taken these screws off uh, for the sake of the video. So let's remove the heat sink carefully, noting that there's a sill pad or whatever there for some thermal management that sits on that CPU. So let's put this to the side and don't get dust or funk all over it. And here's a little chip. Normally I would just do this, but I'm gonna show you the proper way to do this. If you don't have the right tool, you wanna open these up like that with a very small, uh, delicate plastic thing. You know, it could be wood, plastic or wood. You don't wanna use any metal in there because you could, if you touch one of these things, you could just chip away at the chip. You could do a lot of damage. You wanna make sure that you're, sorry, you want to make sure that you don't have any static on you. I'm with my left hand. I'm touching something that's grounded right now and just pull it to the side. And once that was all out of the way, I found this slightly discolored diode. It's D202. It is just slightly discolored. And when I measured it with a meter, it is no longer a diode that has failed open. That's exactly the, the, that's exactly the part that both Brad and Howard kindly pointed me to. So thanks guys. And I don't have the schematic, but Brad mentioned that he had had these two caps here fail as a result of this. These are two little tantalum, uh, 63, sorry, 68 microfarad caps, 16 volts. So I ordered a bunch because there's some over here. I'm about to measure all these. And then I'm going to try to remove and replace them. I've got some little, I've got new components. I've got to get my tweezers out and I'm not sure how much of this I can show because I've got great big hands. I need to be very close to this to be able to see what I'm doing. 
and it is fiddly stuff, and I think the camera's going to be in my way. There are a lot of videos on the internet about surface mount repair. You can watch those and see what I'm doing. I'm using some chip quick to do it. I will try to film it, no guarantees. The work has to come ahead of the video itself. If I can't do good work because the camera's there, what's the point of me doing the work? But before I get started on this, I want to mention something. In previous videos about amps with a lot of surface mount components, I have occasionally mentioned that they can be very difficult to repair, especially from companies that don't offer any schematics for their products, because you've got to go through and interpret all these tiny little things, and these boards can be multi-layer boards where there can be an inner layer where you can't even figure out where the, how the connections are done. It's, it's doable, but it's a lot easier if you actually have a schematic. And if they don't publish the schema if they don't publish the schematic, then I've got to charge the owner all the time it takes to trace it out. The other issue, which is also very common in amps made by companies like Blackstar, not all their models, but enough, is they'll have a surface mount thing here, and it'll be surrounded by some large through-hole radial caps that are kind of surrounding it. You can't get in there to replace that cap unless you remove the very tall capacitors and such that are surrounding it. Here's what I'm talking about. This is fine. Here's all the surface mount stuff. Here's all the through hole radial stuff. I could work with this if I needed to. But if these caps were encircling all this stuff, it just becomes a very expensive process because of a poor design. So when I say surface mount can increase the cost of a repair, it's not because I'm some old guy who doesn't like new technology. Hell, I'm filming this all with new digital stuff. I've got so much high tech stuff. I probably have more high tech gear here than most people who, who like to call me an old guy who doesn't understand technology will ever own in their lives. I don't like poor design, whether that poor design is vintage analog poor design or modern surface mount poor design. I don't like it. I like good examples of either. I like good examples of both. This ice module for its price is actually pretty good. Anyway, let me get off the soapbox and see if I can change these things out and bring this amp back to life. This was a pain in the butt, this inductor here. Um, like I said about through hole components, it can also just be high rise SMD stuff like this inductor. It has four contact points on this inductor and to get it out, I would need two soldering irons. I couldn't, uh, even with a chip quick, I couldn't get all four heated with just one iron. And my other soldering iron is an ancient uh, hacko that's seen better days and it's very temperamental. So I worked around it. I was able to change out what needed to be changed out. So this diode, obviously, it measured open. I actually measured a short. And of these two capacitors, this one also measured a short, well, technically four ohms. That's a good resistance to measure across a cap, don't you think? But I changed out it and its mate there. And I, I measured all these, they're fine. And I have cleaned everything up, got all the flux off, made sure there's no strands of cotton from the little swabs I used with the flux, made sure there's no little bits of, of solder anywhere that could rest against something else and short something else out. Whole thing's been brushed clean. And I powered it up and I have five volts, five volts, five volts. So all signs point to good. I'm gonna put the CPU back in place and see where we're at. All right, here goes nothing. I've got the speaker disconnected, obviously, and it's a uh, cabinet sim on. Should work fine without uh, the speaker connected, solid state. I've got it going to my current limiter just in case, but let's see if there's any magic smoke. All right, so the little light that was flashing saying that uh, it needed to have its uh, firmware updated is no longer flashing, which is the symptom it had. Okay, and the front LED is stabilized at orange, which probably means something to those who have one of these. I have not experienced orange, but it's no longer flashing between red and orange or red and green. That's where that colorblind thing really comes in handy, doesn't it? So let me hook this up to a speaker to see where we're at. Before I put it back in the cab, though it's not all the way in, I made sure there was no DC on the speaker terminals, which could be a problem with the output section, which is a drastic but all too common failure in solid state stuff. It's fine. And in the process, Genius here figured out that the front uh, LED is orange when it's in mute, which is their equivalent of standby. So let's power it on. I don't know why I'm treating like it does have standby. And I've got the front set like I would a real deluxe reverb.
Interesting how there was nothing, nothing, then it was just all there. It's probably way too loud for this mic, which is right over the speaker. I'm going to turn it down for the rest of this. All right, so it lives, but my concern right now is that everything in there is fresh and new and cold. So I'm gonna put it over to the left and I'm gonna turn up really loud and without this little voice mic running, I'm gonna let it run for a while, probably the rest of the day and play it uh, 30 minutes here and there at loud volumes with this whole thing sealed up just to make sure I haven't missed anything and make sure that nothing else is gonna go wrong. What if there's something else which is triggering that diode to fail or that cap to fail? I suspect it's just a circuit right on the fringe of what it's capable of and occasionally you get spikes and there's no current suppression for those things but anyway i digress but uh, i think for the owner this is going to be a good place to be i'll report back if we have any problems if i have time maybe i'll do a, a real recording of this with the mic set up and the owner wants me to update the firmware while it's here i'll be glad to do that for him no big deal Oh, almost forgot. In the description below, I'll put the links to the uh, Chip Quick uh, kit that helps you do this kind of SMD stuff and the uh, caps and diodes necessary for this repair. And uh, hopefully you saw from the video where they are. Thanks for watching.